All right, so we're going to try to fly through this one. Um, this is about patient safety stuff. So, again, it kind of goes um, with the QIQ, QA system. Um, says people entering the EMS system begin with a patient's decision to seek help, right? And it ends when we hand it off to the hospital. In, a, in contrast to that, um, our critical care stuff begins when the referring practitioner or referring call center contacts us to request to move a patient from point A to point B, usually from lower levels of care to higher levels of care or to specialty care, right? Um, the complexities of patient care provide a lot of opportunities for process failures, errors, and adverse outcomes. So, <clears throat> this talks about in the early 1990s, um, the Harvard Medical Practice Study reported that 4% of hospitalized patients suffered significant adverse events during their care. One third of those were secondary to human error. What do you think most of those errors were? Medication errors, right? And then, has anybody ever had surgery? Well, has anybody had surgery recently or been to surgery in paramedic school recently? Let's take an orthopedic surgery. What do they do? They take a big marker, big marker and they mark left arm, right arm, left knee, right? Because there was a lot of people getting shit amputated that like uh, was the wrong thing. So, yeah. Um, so this study um, and others led to the investigation by the Institutes of Medicine. They published a report to Air as Human Building a Safer Healthcare System. It reported a thousand, a hundred thousand Americans die each year secondary to medical errors. Errors are the eighth leading cause of death in the U.S. And improving efforts should focus on improving processes rather than targeting individuals. So. Who knows what the most dangerous month to be in the hospital is? August. New group of residents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, another uh, study in 2001, um, new healthcare system for the 21st century. A uh, report insists healthcare should be safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, effective, and equitable. New England Journal of Medicine article suggested that errors remain high, substandard quality persists. And then in 2007, um, the Institute of Medicine published a, a thing called EMS at the Crossroad and looked specifically at EMS uh, care and the challenges and limitations that we have. American Board of Emergency Medicine recognized EMS as an official subspecialty, creating a certification and minimum standard qualifications and training. So basically what this is, is a residency or a fellowship specifically in EMS. And this is designed for people who want to be EMS medical directors. There's a few of these in the country. There's not very many of these. There's one in Vegas, there's one in Houston, there's one in San Antonio, one in Dallas, um, several in Florida, some up on the East Coast, um, but they're not very common because it's, it's pretty new. Um, patient safety, um, complex because it can be considered a philosophy, a discipline, um, or an attribute. So we're gonna talk about those. So error versus harm. Impetus of patient safety programs um, is showing that adverse medical events are widespread and preventable. Um, we're characterized by quick decisions in our world, um, making complex tasks and long work hours, all of these um, potentially lead to errors. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff being gathered on 24 hour shifts versus 10 and 12 hour shifts and 16 hour shifts. And it's mostly related to fatigue and errors. Not, errors, not all errors cause harm, but it's essential for us to study these errors and look for opportunities to improve the processes that allow them to happen. So for instance, if you make a drug error um, on a pediatric patient and nothing adverse happens, but you go back and you look and chances are 
why did that medication error happen? What did you do wrong? You miscalculated something, right? Decimal got out of place or something like that, right? So what would be an easy fix for that? Huh? Charts. Charts, Broslow tape, or how about this? You got a smartphone that has a calculator on it. That would avoid some of that stuff, right? We just don't think about it. So, a near miss or a close call, an unplanned event that didn't cause injury, illness, or damage, but had the potential to do so. It's indistinguishable from adverse event and all but outcome. It's widely believed that near miss events are heavily underreported. Staff may believe that they'll be disciplined, not supported by supervisors, not reporting necessary if no patient harm was done. What do you think about that? The best way to stay out of trouble is self-report. Self-reported medication error. Absolutely. And not only self-reporting it to your agency, but you need to self-report it to the receiving facility because what goes on from that point on might be based on what you said you did or didn't do, right? Um, we had a, one of those private ambulance helicopters um, that picked up a person at a car wreck and uh, did an RSI and took them into the trauma center and the trauma surgeon's listening to the report and they said they gave, you know, how much versed and then they said they gave 80 of that. And the doc said, I didn't hear you right. How much VEC did you give? He says 80. The doc's like, eight zero? Yeah, 80 milligrams of VEC. Okay, so doc goes back, calls the medical director for the service and says, hey, just gonna give you a heads up. You know, you guys made a medication error. It's not that big a deal. We'll just keep them on a VEC for another three or four days until it wears off. Um, and uh, you probably should review that chart. Oh, great, thanks a lot for the heads up, blah, blah, blah. Three days later, that trauma surgeon got a certified letter saying cease and desist, slander and libeling my crews, or I will sue you. Okay. Ridiculous. Right? <laughs> So, many hospitals and transport services accept staff, expect staff to report near misses. It reduces future risk for everyone, triggers improvement or identifies weak spots in the system, alerts other providers to vulnerabilities and gaps, contributes to planning and strategies to prevent further harm. Right? There's a standardized reporting system by the NAEMT called the, the Event Notification Tool. This is very similar to firefighter close calls. Um, and it's a way that we are tracking things. Mostly what's being tracked right now in that stuff, in addition to medication errors, is like ambulance crashes um, and on-job injuries and like assaults and stuff like that on EMS providers. The USDA also has an adverse event reporting system um, and, um, or the FDA, and what has to be reported to them? Did you know? you are a mandatory reporter as far as this stuff goes this is very specific to um, equipment so if your defibrillator um, doesn't fire um, if you know something happens and you know your your IV pump you know miscalculates and gives too much medicine or whatever um, you're supposed to report that to the FDA and there's a there's a form on there and what they're doing is they're tracking that stuff because if there's trends, they go back to manufacture, and then that's what triggers recalls, right? So, a medical error is a failure of a planned action to be completed as intended, or the use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. So here's what I would tell you. Um, one of the biggest things that you're going to see that fall into this category is airway management. Failure to properly assess that patient to anticipate difficulties and having plans B, C, D, and E get you in trouble. That's what gets you in trouble. It says higher error rates with serious consequences are more likely in ICUs, ORs, 
EDs and during critical care transport. Why? Stakes are a lot higher in these patients, right? They're typically sicker. They're more technologically dependent um, on different kinds of meds and stuff, right? So we can categorize these as adverse drug events, which would be what? An adverse drug event. Yeah, a reaction to something usually, right? Um, wrong site surgeries, we discussed that. Falls, so allowing people, you know, to go to the bathroom on their own in the ICU with slick socks on a slick floor, right? When they should be having somebody with them to hold them. Burns, pressure ulcers, how do we get pressure ulcers? Yeah, not being moved, right? Like they're supposed to be. Mistaken patient identities. <coughs> Um, I'm, I don't know how it is in the hospitals here, but like in Clark County, um, when we give a med, we have to scan their barcode on their arm and then scan the med. And then it all correlates in a computer. If something's wrong, it's going to tell us, or it's supposed to tell us anyway. So that kind of helps. That's a process change um, that probably eliminates a significant amount of medication errors, if I was guessing. So. Uh, reporting systems, there's both voluntary and mandatory. We've kind of discussed that. The key to access to success is having a management system that assures providers that the culture is um, that of a high reliable organization, which means you're not going to get in trouble for self-reporting. We're going to use that as part of the QA process. We're going to retrain you, re-educate you, or look at the process that failed that caused that problem and fix it so that it's not an issue um, in the system anymore, right? So if you self-report, self you're higher up to immediately to the state with that? That depends on who you ask. I, I me personally, I, I don't believe that. Some people read the Iowa code as absolutely you're a mandatory reporter on that kind of stuff. I'm not. Um, I don't think, I mean, it, let me put it a different way. So if I investigate it and I see that it, it was an issue caused by inadequate training or inadequate preparation or whatever, I'm going to use that as a QA thing. If I see you did it because it was malicious or it was on purpose or something like that, that's a little different. But just throwing people under the bus because they gave too much fentanyl, I don't, I don't prescribe to that theory myself. So, yeah. Um, so acknowledge that your organization's involved in high-risk activities and um, it's very important for us to do our job safely, right? So supporting a blame-free environment, maintaining organizational commitment to address reported errors and safety concerns. Key elements of just, just culture. So this is talking about safety. Um, this is a big deal. Um, this is a big deal in EMS right now is, is culture of safety stuff. Um, we're, we're hurting and killing too many of our own people and too many patients because we're doing the same thing that we've always done. And one of the big things with that is driving. Um, I did a, a lecture at the National Registry Refresher a couple weeks ago, and it was primarily about driving lights and sirens. And I told them straight up in the beginning, I'm gonna piss some of you off and I'm gonna step on some toes. So just get ready. Because it's that sacred cow, right? Driving lights and sirens, that's what we all got in the business for, right? And so I showed them all kinds of statistics. And the thing about me is, is I don't have to prove you wrong. You've got to prove me wrong. When I teach a class, you got to prove me wrong. I've got all kinds of studies and statistics and all kinds of stuff on there. They can't dispute numbers, you know? And then what did I do? Threw up some pictures of Midwest crashes, Des Moines fire crashes. It doesn't happen here, right? Why? What's Des Moines fire do? Just fucking run lights and sirens to the hospital every patient. Why? Turnover. Oh, we don't have enough trucks on the street. We gotta get back to service. Look at me. I'm a fireman. 
getting back in service so you can run more calls doesn't compute. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't compute. So we better come up with something different. You know? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. Running with the bulls. Just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean it wasn't incredibly stupid. Just saying. Um, so, um, Agile's culture also helps us distinguish types of errors such as human error, like slips, at-risk behavior, taking shortcuts, reckless behavior, so ignoring required safety steps. So, where would emergency driving fall into this? Two different places, right? How about buckling up the back of your ambulance? That's another one of those things that we've never done. Yet, if you look, what, what did we say helicopters were? Higher levels of care, right? So you ask somebody why you don't wear a seatbelt in the back of the ambulance. And the typical answer is, well, I can't take care of my patient. And I throw up the asshole with me. But Mr. Klein from Mercy One, do y'all wear seat belts? You have helmets in your helicopter? Yes, we do. We all just said they're a higher level of care, yet they somehow are able to take care of their patients with seatbelts on. How's that work? Right? But again, it, it's that thing, unless we remind each other that we need to buckle up, then it's never going to change. Okay? I've been in this business long enough where we didn't wear gloves. And it was like a badge of honor to come back to the station and sit down and eat supper with blood on your shirt and blood on your hands. It was the thing. It was a badass call. It was cool. You know, whatever. Right? And then something happened in the mid 80s. It's called AIDS and HIV and hepatitis. And so then we started wearing gloves, right? Most of you never grew up not wearing seatbelts in a car. Did you always wear seatbelts when you were young? No, I can remember riding in the back deck of the car going to grandma's house. I was sleeping up on the back deck or in the floorboard, right? But most people under the age of 35 probably never knew anything other than wearing seatbelts in their car. Yet you got people who don't wear seatbelts in their ambulance. You got people who want to bypass it in the fire truck. They'll put it behind them and stick it in because they're sitting on the seat, right? It, it just, it's perplexing to me. But until we start making a conscious effort to change that, then it's, it's never going to change. So if every time I'm in the back of that ambulance, I got my thing on, that peer pressure is going to make you put yours on, right? And then that student that's in the back is going to say, ooh, I better put mine on. And then eventually what's going to happen? We don't even think about it. We'll just do it, right? That's the just culture uh, of safety. So. Um, high, uh, HROs, Highly Reliable Organizations. It's a new concept um, contributing to an effective safety culture. Failures are managed by HROs so that failure doesn't reach the public. So again, this is part of like a QA system, right? Examples of industries that are HROs, airlines, okay? How many times do you think that, that pilot in the front of that 727 Boeing jet has flown that jet. Thousands of hours. Thousands and thousands of hours. Yet, what do they do every single time they go to the cockpit? They pull out a checklist. A checklist. Why do they do that? So back when CRM, uh, Crew Resource Management, actually was invented by the airline industry in the late 70s and early 80s, because there was an airplane that had a problem with their landing gear, they thought it was an idiot light, so they're circling around the airport, circling around the airport, circling around the airport, and ran out of gas and crashed. Because nobody was watching the gas gate. Thus, the invention of CRM in 1978. And by 81, we had dropped the uh, amount of aircraft incidents like 60%. It's a crazy amount of numbers. So, Medication and prescription errors, most notable uh, type of errors that we see, uh, but less common errors include wrong patient, transfusion errors, so that's not verifying multiple times um, that the patient's getting the right blood and it's the right patient and all that stuff. Um, suicides, falls, burns, wrong side procedures, errors in transition of care or handoffs, 
So what would that be? There's transition to care handoffs. Not given enough information, right? Especially about stuff that we um, did on the transfer or stuff that happened at the hospital before we took off. Process of patient receiving a medication is complex and fought with opportunities for error, including those involving prescribing, dispensing, administering, and monitoring. Um, we give drugs every single day. The problem in EMS right now is that, um, so what are we taught? When, when we're taught medications in paramedic school, what are we taught? Check how many times? Check them five times, the five rights, right? But we always check it at least three times. When you pull it out, after you draw it up, and then right before you give it, right? You should check it, okay? So how do medication errors still happen? One way it happens is because of the nationwide drug shortage, we get what we can get as far as meds, and they're coming in different concentrations. And we're not following the three rules, or we're not following the three checks, and we're not following the five rights, and we're making medication errors. An example is we were used to getting fentanyl 100 mics in 10 mils, and now we get it 100 mics in 2 mils. Pretty easy medication error to make if you're not watching, right? Second thing that could happen is, is that I draw something up in the syringe and I give it to Rebecca and she just pushes it. I'll bet you as a nurse she won't do that. So how do I fix that? Do I not ever draw anything up for her? No, I draw it up for her and do what? I hand her the vial that come out of also. And what's she gonna do? She's gonna verify it because ultimately who's responsible? Whoever pushed it, right? That's what we do in the back of the ambulance, especially the drugs that we don't give a lot, right? I'll pull up some drugs and I'll go, I got so-and-so expires uh, October of 18, uh, 100 milligrams per mil, all right, I'm going to drop three mils. All right, here's three mils. I'm going to hand it to her. And then she's going to verify it again. But if I say it out loud in the back of the ambulance, if I'm making a mistake, surely somebody might catch it. Right? Does that make me a weak paramedic? If I have to look stuff up in the protocols, does that make me not a good guy? No. It makes me a smart guy because I don't want to make an error that's potentially going to hurt my patient. Right? Especially on stuff that you don't give all the time. So... Uh, wrong patient, wrong side procedures, you know, it's kind of crazy that that kind of stuff can happen, right? Always use multiple patient identifiers, you know, you uh, use a universal timeout. So an integral part of care in the ED and pre-hospital care is transitioning to care. There should be standardized approaches to transitions in care to help alleviate handoff errors. They use the SBAR technique, uh, which is Situation Background Assessment Recommendation. This was developed in the U.S. Navy, um, and it's considered best practices in healthcare. It allows for a brief yet concise handoff of data. <coughs> this is very similar to the 30-second thing that you get when you go to the trauma centers. And they give you a 30-second timeout, and you better get your story out while that 30 seconds is going on, right? Um, so this just talks about the S-bar. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, system approach. Most human errors occur in the context of a poorly designed system or a process problem, right? System approach seeks to identify those situations and give rise to human error and change them before it happens. So the Swiss cheese model says that uh, uh, in this model, people make errors that result in consequences because of flawed systems, i.e. the holes in the cheese. Most of the time, the holes do not line up, but when they do, it could lead to a catastrophic error. So different things. Organizational influences, unsafe supervision, precondition for unsafe acts, unsafe acts, and the impact of the error, failed or absent defense system.
define a sentinel event or an adverse serious adverse event it is a patient safety event which an error reached the patient and result in death permanent harm or severe temporary harm with interventions required to sustain life um, example if you gave the wrong drug you could cause that right or gave too much of the drug um, events are considered sentinel because they triggered an immediate investigation and response by the healthcare system most hospitals activate a serious adverse event response system when this happens formalized notification chain of command immediate huddle of the team debriefing and then the root cause analysis to fix the problem for future strategies to avoid error successful strategies for manufacturing industry are being applied to healthcare. what's that called anybody know Six Sigma and the lean process. Um, they're identifying ways to improve efficiency and reduce errors, and thus, what are they doing? They're increasing productivity and decreasing costs. All right, so lean manufacturing, L E A N, or um, Six Sigma. Uh, I'm not going to go through these. CRM. Um, 1977 Canary Islands two fully loaded 747s collided on the runway and killed 600 people um, this triggered major changes in the aviation industry and creating the development of CRM um, it emphasizes a culture of mutual support and teamwork uh, it is an expectation that any crew member can and should voice a concern many industries have adopted these lessons like the military nuclear industry and uh, now healthcare um, like in the air medical world we call that the rule of 51 percent three to go two to say or one to say no so if anybody on the crew was uncomfortable and just said I'm not good with this you abort the mission or you don't take it at all um, another uh, area of emphasis is simulation training um, this is being used in every facet of medicine even anesthesia uh, fellows and anesthesia residents are training on um, high def management and stuff so I think um, when it's done correctly um, it's a very very big benefit so you'll get to see that um, and it's better to make mistakes in the sim lab than in a real patient right and so you'll you'll learn a lot I think we did the difficult airway course um, a few weeks ago when we did sims at the end and I think everybody probably uh, got the most out of those um, than they did even the lectures and stuff because it was real it was pretty real and it made you think and you, you had to make decisions and time was clicking so um, everybody's using simulations so failure model and effect uh, analysis uh, again, it was used by uh, NASA uh, working on the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo space programs. Um, use of failure mode and effect analysis. One constructs a risk matrix for potential failure. So what are we talking about here? Like low volume, high risk procedures, such as what? Intubation, right? It's a low, low volume. We don't do just a ton of them, but it has a lot of high risk for consequences if we don't do it right or we're not successful with it right um, says EMS care is potentially more dangerous and less controlled than the same care provided in the ED uh, safety strategies and team training are only now being incorporated into the EMS system so when I was at Mercy we incorporated the EMS safety class for the NAMT and every EMT and paramedic school to try to instilled those good habits in people from the very beginning we also did what else we put in emergency driving as part of both of those why because that's the primary job of an EMT right yet we didn't give them any training or any time in school on so we did an eight-hour emergency vehicle course that included a driving course so uh, we, we were trying to set the standard uh, to help um, minimize some of these things that we were seeing key issues related to quality include your clinical judgment so when we have to make a decision 
we have to draw from our experiences. If we don't have experience, if we've never seen this situation before, what do we draw from? Education. Our education, right? Our training. So the more training, more education you have, the better prepared you're going to be to deal with situations that you may not have had to come across before. Adverse events and error reporting, communications, ground vehicle safety, primarily driving issues, aircraft safety again, um, you know, what you're wearing there, the weather minimums, all that kind of stuff. We'll talk about that. So what's scope creep? Some of this is, uh, I would refer to as Paragot Syndrome, right? By golly, I got a box full of drugs, I'm gonna give some. Maybe not. Maybe that's not the right thing for your patient, right? Um, support and potential training needed in decision making because you have low frequency, high risk skills, um, and we have issues there. Again, reporting errors, we need to have a system um, that we can report errors without fear of being uh, in trouble. Communications is also always a deal, right? Um, in every, every mess, everything that hurts people, you know, firefighter fatalities, everything, communications is always like the top of the list of potential issues that caused it. So studies of pre-hospital communications have examined the handoff between EMS and ED and demonstrate a loss of key clinical information. Dr. Bledsoe wrote an article called Adios Rampart. And he did a study where the EMS people gave reports to emergency medicine residents. And then when they got to the hospital, they asked them what they remembered about the report. And guess what? They remembered 10% of the report. So the translation was, what's the point of giving that report? And you have to give it again when you get there. So like where I worked, we just called the ER, the driver called the ER and said, we're 10 minutes out with a 58 year old female, uh, female um, stroke, stable virus. That's it, we didn't tell nobody nothing. Because when you got there, then you told them the whole story. Preventing vehicle harm to the patient provider. Um, again, everything in the back should be in its own place and should be secure. That's equipment and people, right? Not using the shoulder straps on the cot. It's one of my pet peeves. You know, strike or put them on there for something other than looks. You put them on there to secure a patient, right? And again, why do we not use them? Well, it's in my way. It's in your way for doing what? What are you going to do? So take them off, do what you need to do, put them back on. I don't, I don't understand what the problem is. Um, air medical stuff, um, CRM, um, go, no go decisions. Again, um, looking at the uh, weather, looking at comfortability, you know, all the different stuff. Used to be we would. We would tell the pilot, hey, we need to go from here to here. And they say, well, I'm not sure about the weather. But if we don't go, that seven-year-old girl's going to die. And then they make a bad decision and try to go, and then they crash and kill three people. So what did we do? We changed that. Can we go from here to there, to there, back? She goes and checks the weather. Nope, we can't. Okay. That's the end of it. You take that human emotion thing out of it. Because when you put emotion in it, you make bad decisions. So. Um, talking about uh, the SAEs during transport, 1 in 15 patients experience um, either hypotension, initiation of vasopressor therapy, or respiratory events. That's pretty significant, right? Here's the thing to remember. What is stable on the ground is unstable in the air. So your patient might look okay sitting in that ER, but then the stresses of flight and then the altitude changes, even though they're minute in, in reality, um, typically causes your patients to be sicker. So just remember the golden rule. What's stable on the ground is unstable in the air. And then that puts you in a different mindset, 
so that you are um, anticipating issues, right? So how do we fix these uh, adverse events? Ensure correct crew configuration is available. Specific checklist uh, with sections for ventilator, IV pumps, and other equipment. Ensure availability of appropriate equipment that has been maintained and checked. 